everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out to seminar today. I am super excited to introduce to you our grad student invited speaker for the year, Dr. Emily Taylor from California Polytechnic State University. Um, Emily actually got her bachelor's at UC Berkeley in English, but did her PhD at uh, the University of Arizona studying reproductive endocrinology and ecology of Western diamondback rattlesnakes. She uh, is now a professor at Cal Poly and the head of the Physiological Ecology of Reptiles Lab, where she works mostly on stress physiology, thermal ecology, and water balance in Western reptiles, as well as reptiles kind of from around the world. She's expanded out to Guam uh, and is this summer heading to Greece to look at lizards. So along with that, she is also a huge advocate for snakes and is currently working on lots of different projects that kind of um, uh, uh, de-evilize de snakes, trying to make them cute, trying to make them fun. There's an awesome project going on right now called Project Rattle Cam. I actually, I think I put a link to it in the email where we basically uh, was a citizen science or a public science project. We like to harness the power of public science in uh, the Pearl Lab research, where there's actually cameras up on a set of rattlesnake dens throughout the West. There are live cams, there are video cams, and people actually can go online and help identify what rattlesnakes are doing. So if you are interested in working with the public to engage in silence, uh, she has a lot of experience with that. She is also the president, the current president of the American Society of Ichthyologists and Herpetologists. So she's been working a lot with the societies to um, <clears throat> kind of broaden DEI efforts as a whole and recently published on quantifying the gender gap in authorship and herpetology paper. So we are exploring some broader things beyond just research in the lab. But one of the biggest reasons I invited here, our nominated her here today, and you all I think invited her, was um, because she is also a very accomplished teacher, and she works at not an R1 university, not a place quite like Michigan, a little bit different. Um, and she's been recognized for her teaching, her mentorship across numerous ways through many awards. And she's going to tell us a little bit about careers outside of the world of R1 universities and how to help us prepare for these. So without further ado, um, please welcome Emily Taylor. Thank you, Haley, for that introduction. Can everyone hear me just fine? Uh, I'm super happy to be here. Thanks to all of you for voting to invite me. It's my first time to Michigan. It's super awesome and such a beautiful campus. I've really had a great time getting to know some of the students and faculty today, and I can't wait to continue. Uh, so I went to an R1 university for my undergrad and for my PhD. And I am now a professor. I have been for the past 18 years at what I think we would call a master's granting institution. And what this whole process of you know, then being on a whole bunch of search committees and so on has shown me is that there are a variety of types of jobs out there. And there are huge differences in how we apply for those jobs. And so many of you are here today because you want a job in the future. <laughs> Imagine that, right? Um, you are at an R1 university. In fact, the EEB department here is one of the top, if not the top, biology program at an R1 in the country. So you are at the pinnacle here. And uh, many of you want a job in R1, are suited to a job in R1, and that's great because that's where a lot of the really cutting edge science goes on. That's where a lot of the resources are located. However, many of you may be like me, and you didn't really know what else exists out there and how there can be jobs that are just as good but different. I'm here today to tell you a little bit about those jobs, but mostly to tell you how to apply for those jobs. I heard today when speaking to the graduate students that many of you are interested in those types of jobs. And for those faculty who are here, who are here today, you already have the jobs, right? But many of you may benefit from my talk in terms of learning how to best advise your students who maybe aren't sure if they want R1 jobs on how to prepare for and how to be a successful candidate for these non-R1 jobs. Uh, so first of all, feel free to take notes and so on, but you can also email me for a copy of this presentation later if you don't want to write a bunch of stuff down, if you just want to be able to pay attention. And off we go. OK, I'm going to keep hiding that. OK, so this um, if you don't follow a LEGO grad student on Twitter, you probably should. So this is where many of us in this room right, find ourselves at. We get that imposter syndrome. We watch all these people who are giving these incredible job talks. Right now, when people interview at Cal Poly, 
I'm like, could I get a job now? I'm not sure. Um, but I'm here to tell you that, um, yes, for many of us, you can. And a lot of times it involves a change in your worldview that actually may be really beneficial to you. So I'm going to start with the doom and gloom, and then we're going to do a full 180, I promise you, all right? So um, it is now true that a faculty job is what's considered the alternative career in biology. It was different back in the 1970s when um, my academic grandparents, who taught my advisors, right, were getting jobs. Then you basically would get a job. You were guaranteed a job out of your PhD in academia. That's not true anymore. Um, this is uh, from the American Society for Cell Biology. You can kind of follow it through. Every year, 16,000 students start biology PhD programs. Only about 9,000 receive them. And we see the pipeline here going into postdocs, and a lot of them spin, 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 spin. And I think that's probably increased in recent years with the pandemic and the hiring freezes that happened at many universities. But then we can go on and see that, my gosh, look, there's, there's you know, not that many jobs out there, right? There's only about 25,000 current, um, you know, there's non-tenure track academic positions, about 29,000 current tenured and tenure track positions, and every year we're putting 16,000 students out there. There's not enough jobs for people, right? So my job today here is to not convince you you should have a job in academia, not to convince you that you should have a job at a non-R1, but to help those of you prepare for jobs at a non-R1 if you want one. There's a lot of jobs that are in um, industry that may be appropriate. There's a lot of jobs that are um, not even science-related jobs. So of course not everyone's going to go into academia. But look at the top here. A faculty job is an alternative career. 8%, less than 8% of entering PhD students at this rate are going to become faculty. Another recent study suggested that about 70% of all PhD students want a job in academia, and about 14% of them get a job in academia. So like I always tell my grad students, yes, it's true. You don't just get a job. You need to be the best. But what we don't want is to have a situation where you really are the best, and you don't know how to communicate that to the search committee. So that's why I'm here today. So before I go into all of those tips and tricks, I wanted to ask you for a thought question. Which animal is better? So feel free to yell out your, your, your opinion and tell me or why. Just yell them out. What would you say? The, 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 yeah, OK, the marine one. All right, cool. The marine one's better. What else? What do you all think? Who's better? Yell them out. Who's better? What do we like? Who likes the marine iguana? Raise your hand. Who thinks the hummingbird is better? Who is perplexed at this exercise because of the concept of better, right? OK, good. So we can take any aspect of these animals' biology, and we can say that under a certain circumstance, maybe the ectothermy might be favored in one animal, or the endothermy favored in The point is that these, are, these animals are very different, and they exhibit trade-offs, where each one of them may be better suited to survive, reproduce, do well in different environments. And I want to use this as a theme for the talk today, which is to show you, that hopefully, that jobs in academia are also going to represent trade-offs. What many of you may have heard, certainly what I heard when I was growing up in the R1 system, was that R1 jobs were the best ones, and that anything else, according to my advisor, was slumming it. The jobs were worse. The jobs were not good. The jobs were something you did if you could not get an R1 job. Okay. And for many people, that might be true if you really do want to do certain types of research that require resources that are exclusively available in R1. However, I would like to provide you with an alternative point of view today based on my experience. So in general, with some of the terminology we're using today, we're going to be talking about places like, like I said, this ultimate R1 here on the right, University of Michigan, where we tend to have bachelor's students, master's, PhDs, um, postdocs. And then on the left-hand side, a lot of the universities that many of us went to as undergrads, or you may have heard about these liberal arts colleges where it's typically bachelor's degrees. We sometimes hear the qualifier selective liberal arts colleges for the ones that are um, really high quality, hard to get into. And then there's the ones um, that are in the middle in terms of what degrees they offer. They're the master's granting institutions, which offer bachelor's and master's degrees. And that is my university there in the center the California Polytechnic State University, which is the flagship of the California State University system, publicly funded universities in California, where our focus is on undergraduate education and all the California State University excellence in teaching, but we do have significant research as well. 
In general, when we talk about either of the ones on the left, we call those PUIs, primarily undergraduate institutions. These are some of those acronyms that go around on Twitter where you might be like, what are they talking about? Slacks, PUIs, I ah, can't keep it track. Well, now you know. I did want to refer you for, future, for further reference to this website, Small Pond Science. My friend Terry McGlynn public, uh, posts a bunch of information on all kinds of things related to success and jobs, including his articles on R1 versus not R1. And I'd like to introduce what I'm going to be telling you by saying that Terry says it best when he says, it's not easier, our jobs, it's just different. So my job as someone who focuses, me personally, about half and half on teaching and research, it's not easier to do what I do. It's just very, very different. And in fact, let's see, I can just get the map. This is what he says as well. Your PhD advisor at an R1 might disagree with that, and other faculty at research institutions might also be skeptical of this notion. Many of you here today are, um, uh, probably skeptical as well, and that's fine, but what Terry says is that, but belief without knowledge isn't acceptable. So today I'm here to give you the knowledge about how to potentially apply for these jobs. But first, why? Why might you want these jobs? What are some reasons to consider PUI positions, okay? Here's just a few of those reasons. First of all, one of the main things that can be really important, especially in today's climate, where they keep Chipping away at public funding for research without really changing sometimes the requirements for getting that funding is that there's less focus on grant funding and more focus on the actual quality of the research and the mentoring that you're doing for students. So when I'm evaluated for tenure, it's about um, the, num the number and the quality of, of the research experience that I've provided for students and not for the grant dollars that I've brought in. They love the grant dollars, don't get me wrong, but you don't need to have them. The second thing is that what many of us discover when we really do teaching is that teaching is incredibly rewarding and fun, and I will also say important. And this is one of those things that I didn't really think about until I had many years of doing it, is when I have opportunities to engage, not just lecturing students, but engaging them in critical thinking, engaging them in research experience, then I am making such a huge impact on such a big number of people. So that, that is something, that is one of the main reasons why I love teaching so much. Another thing that a lot of people don't know about is that um, PUIs inherently have a great amount of flexibility when it comes to teaching and research. So if I get a big NSF grant, I can buy a bunch of my time out from teaching and I can focus on research exclusively for a long time. I can get those resources that I need. But if my grant runs out and I don't have another one, then I go back to teaching a little more. I can choose my own adventure, and that is something that can't be said for a lot of other positions. And one of the big ones, I think, is that you right now and what you want is not necessarily you in 20 years. So we all see things like academic researcher burnout. We see things like people's lives changing from various sorts of things, changing interests, family, whatever it is. And being able to have that flexibility later on is something that you will appreciate no matter what kind of job you have. And then tenure rates. Let's just, let's, let's not gloss over how important this is, okay? So at my university, the California State University System, where there's thousands of professors, tenure rate is 92%, which is extremely high. And that is because the tenure process is based primarily on excellence in teaching, excellence in collegiality, and then excellence in student-centered research, which can be done without always having to get an enormous NIH or NSF grant. And that can be contrasted with one of the only studies that's available, it's a little old now, but it's still pretty similar, looking at job security in R1 universities, and notably these data do include data from the University of Michigan, where it shows you that it's a little bit closer to 50%. So all of us know this, right? We know stories of people who didn't attain um, tenure. We know that the tenure rates are higher for males than for females, and that's just not true at our universities. So it is um, really nice, trust me, when you start to go about the business of adulting to know that you're gonna be able to have that job security as life continues on. Okay, so I'm gonna spend the rest of the time today talking about, you've decided to apply for these PUI positions. Um, note, this is a photo from um, the Cal Poly peer of us doing marine biology research to exemplify the fact that, at, you know, and one example is at Cal Poly, our marine science resources are literally the same as at any other major research university. So don't write off, even those of you who do want R1s, don't write off all PUIs. There may be ones that are appropriate for you. 
Now, how do you do it so that people um, on the search committees will notice you? Okay, so uh, this re recently made the rounds on Twitter, and it was fascinating because, you know, this, this guy's hilarious. Uh, Dear job applicant, please send us a cover letter that no one will read. Also, spend all this time writing a teaching philosophy that no one will read. These documents are required, but the final de decision will be made on the basis of your publications, right? So this really exemplifies what some of the frustrations are with applying for jobs, but this is not how it is at my school. This is not the case at non-R1s. Absolutely not the case. They are going to look at that cover letter. They might not look at your publications. So let me tell you exactly what they're gonna look at. Throughout the talk, I'm gonna be giving you pro tip uh, um, uh, images here that tell you really important things that you have to do if you want to be applying for PUIs. And the first pro tip is that you spend all this time writing your teaching philosophy, your research statement, your diversity statement, and you've got all these nuggets of wonderful things about you that are buried within there. And they're all gonna sit there and read them, and they're gonna be like telling each other about how wonderful you are. No, they're probably only gonna read your cover letter or your CV in the first round. And then you're gonna get put into a maybe pile or a no pile based on that. And then they're really gonna read the rest of the, um, the material in the maybe file. So this is extremely different from an R1 um, in this case because um, the information really needs to be, I mean, I would, let me back up. A lot of what I'm telling you today is gonna apply to an R1 as well. This might be true for an R1 as well, but you need to make sure that you have the right information in the right places. So let me explain that. We all know that this is the pathway to getting any sort of job, uh, including one at a non-R1. Um, you, your PhD, and during your PhD and your postdoc, you're getting publications, grants, and contracts. Hopefully during your postdoc, if you want a non-R1 position, you're getting teaching experience. I want to explicitly go out and say that you need teacher of record experience. Not need, but your chances of getting a non-R1 job are dramatically increased if you have teacher of record experience. So I knew this, and I went and taught at a community college in the evening when I was getting my PhD so that I would have an anatomy class that I was in charge of. And that absolutely made the difference. The search committee told me that later on. So TAing is often enough, but not always enough. And then with all of this information, um, all of this experience, you're gonna do your application, you're gonna have your interviews, and you're gonna have your offer and negotiation. All this should look pretty familiar. Now I'm gonna take you through some of the really important things to do. Here's just some of the places where you can look for the application. There's many more places than this. This information you can already find online. Google, where do I look for jobs? These are just a few of the examples of the places, and like I said, I'm happy to send you this information later on. More and more, I feel like social media is where a lot of the jobs are being found out about. Um, okay, tips for non-R1 jobs. Um, do your research on the university and make sure that you know the basics about the geographic locality, the student body, and the faculty expertise, because if you don't know that, or if you say something that is counter to that, it's gonna come out in your cover letter and the people are gonna put you in the no pile. That sounds really hurtful, like how dare they do that? But they're going over many applications and you have to cater to what the people want to see. Make sure your application is very eye-catching. Why should they hire you? Feel free to use language like, I'm very excited about this and I really feel like I'm a fit for this job and let me tell you why. Be, feel free to be excited. Please provide everything they ask for. I'm not kidding you. It's not gonna come into my file if there's a missing piece. Like, I don't even get to see it. I don't even get to follow up with you and say, your diversity statement is missing. Please send that in. Or there's a letter of recommendation missing. Like, if this is a job you really want, follow up and make sure everything is complete. You can write to the administrative assistant who's in charge of that. You can find out, just follow up. And then this is the one that's been very controversial, but I will stick to my guns 10,000 times over because I've seen it happen on every single search that we've done. Personalize all your materials specifically for that university. And I don't just mean to make all of your statements and then have a underlined spot where you have the name of the university to remind you to change that out in every application. People sometimes forget. <laughs> it's embarrassing when we get a job application. Everyone's nodding, you've seen that before. But I don't just mean that, I mean to actually truly personalize. I posted this on Twitter and it caused a big of a stir back in 2018. So we had a relatively small pool of applicants for a recent job. 
65, and only one of them did something that I'm going to recommend that you do, which is looking up the courses at the university that you want to teach and including the names and number of the courses in that. And I said, this is one recommendation I give in this talk that I give when I go to universities. Do this. Because it's probably more important to do this at a teaching-oriented school. And people got mad at me as though I was the one who made this rule. Can't we save the in-depth look into program for the phone interview stage? We have to put in dozens of applications for any chance. So then uh, Javin, who's my colleague, wrote back and said, it might be better to put in fewer for the positions you're actually interested in. Whatever, we can argue about that. But then the person got mad at me and said, I know you've doubled down on this, but I think you should be asking this of your shortlist and not make it in the first cut. It's unreasonable and unkind. I'm sorry, but it's the truth, right? Like, I'm trying to be kind by telling you all what people are looking at in applications. And my, my, my version of being kind and reasonable is to tell you they want to see the courses, at least by the names of the courses. But the numbers show that you did the extra mile in doing your research. So then I had a bunch of people agreeing with me. I agree we get 700 applications for an opening. We're looking for people who want to be at a selective liberal arts college like ours. And effective ways to demonstrate this is they know about our courses. I've chaired several church, uh, searches for tenure track faculty. Applicants that have tailored their applications to a job are more appealing to search committees. I did this for each job I applied for last year. I think it does make a difference. Trust me, it does. It can be, as, it can be super annoying when you're staying up late every night doing this, at least for the jobs that you're most interested in, but it will help you, I promise you. Okay, so let's go through some tips about the actual application. Here's where there's some boots to the ground of things that make a difference when I am sitting there reading all these applications and looking for my future colleague and collaborator. The cover letter should be one to two pages, no longer. It should summarize your teaching, research, and commitment to inclusion and diversity in approximately equal length paragraphs. So we oftentimes will get one where they focus exclusively on research and they also say they want to teach at the bottom. That's a signal to us that the person is not interested in a, a, teaching, a more teaching intensive job. Um, discuss how your research is student-centered. So I want you to think about, in all, and this goes for the teaching philosophy as well, when you're writing your teaching philosophy, do a little bit less on, um, on you know, the Bloom's taxonomy and how you use it and talk in, in terms of what the students are going to gain from it. And when you're talking about your research, talk less about the actual research itself and talk about what students will do. Students will gain experience doing this. Students will publish papers on this. My goal is to watch my students graduate and get jobs in biology because they were able to do this conservation research, those types of things. So instead of me, 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 it's my students and what they're doing. That's what they want to see. And then once again, be excited. We're reading a thousand of these. This goes for any job application. We're reading a thousand of these, and people who are like providing really cool examples and acting excited in their active language are the ones who are more likely to get our attention. Uh, okay, here's another pro tip that I, um, it's slightly controversial. I've heard a few people uh, disagree with this, but I think they only disagree with it when people overuse it. So on your statements, you need to do things like make subsections with headings and underline or italicize or embolden key concepts because it breaks up the page and it provides a completely different feeling to me when I'm reading it. When I open an application and it's a sea of text, I die a little inside before I read it. But when I see like, ooh, okay, there's the philosophy for teaching, ooh, here's the classes they taught, and here's the, ooh, and this is the like, statement that really brings it all together, I can glance it over first, I can get this cozy feeling about them, and then I dive in. Um, please make sure the whole thing is not emboldened. <laughs> it makes it really hard to read. Like, so do this and do this well, and this will be your friend in everything that you do in the future. Um, so the teaching statement is one of the places you want to do this in to a big degree. Your teaching statement, um, follow the rules for what they want. They may have a certain page limit, um, but you should definitely divide it into labeled subsections. Here's some examples of the kind of ones you may, may want to do, but it depends on how you want to do it. Um, here's a great thing that you need to do. Provide specific examples of things that you've done in class. Like, um, like uh, the Batrachian barf bowl would be a great example. Then things that people would come, people would actually walk down the hallway and be like, did you see this thing that so-and-so said? We need to invite them because that happens all the time. Um, you need to focus on pedagogy. So it's no longer enough to be a good teacher because you can clearly lecture to someone. It's now important to be familiar with biology education research and to know about active learning techniques that go beyond think-pair-share, which is great. 
but you need to be familiar with those things and talk about ways that you've done things and how you've watched it change your students. By the way, if this sounds really intimidating, then try to seek out some teaching experience and ask people who do this what to watch them. Go to classrooms. I watched my colleagues to learn how to do this. I didn't come up with this stuff. I watched them. Um, I, there's, that's what I said before already. Identify by name and course number those courses that you'd like to teach at their university, especially those they mentioned in the job ad. Again, controversial. Someone said, one person said, ooh, but this could backfire if you're naming these courses that are pet courses for the faculty members. I disagree with that because if someone says they want to teach herpetology, then I'm like, okay, that's cool. Um, maybe they'll get a chance to do it. Maybe, maybe not. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel threatening to me, but it's not like you're saying, I won't take this job unless I can teach that one class. You're just showing your broad interest in all the classes they have. Uh, super important at a non-R1 university to describe how you'd like to teach at all levels of the curriculum, not in your first year, not in any given semester, just over the course of your career. You want to teach introductory level biology. You want to teach advanced senior courses in your specialty area. You want to design graduate seminars that are on some niche topic. You want to teach non-majors and majors. Um, by the way, if that sounded horrible to you, <laughs> then it's one of these indicators about what kinds of jobs you may want, right? To me, it sounds exciting, right, to be able to teach all these different students from different backgrounds. If it does sound exciting to you, then maybe a job at a non-R1 is a job for you. You can introduce classes that, that you'd like to teach, but they don't currently offer, but you should make sure that these are not super specialty niche classes exclusively. So we get a lot of problems with people saying that they want to teach like, you know, um, the graduate seminar on, you know, um, high elevation bird flight over the um, Andes. The Andes are the wrong. Himalayas, thank you. And we're like, okay, that would be cool, but like that shouldn't be the only one that you should do. You should be talking about something that's broader of more interest to more students because that's how most of the courses are at universities like this. Okay, the research statement. The research statement is super important, and this is something that actually has changed over the years as I've been giving this talk. So I'm not just giving the same talk that I gave when I started doing this talk 10 years ago. I've been watching how things have changed, and there's been a change in my department as we hire more and more younger faculty who are more interested in research, you have to please everybody now. So in the past, it was more like, okay, this person needs to be a good teacher and a student-centered researcher. It's really perfect if they're the right fit. And now they really need to be doing cool research too. So I have some great tips for you on how to do that. Also labeled subsections, please. That's a theme over and over. Past research, current projects, whatever. You can include your figures. Um, this is super important. Provide specific examples of undergraduate and, if applicable, graduate level uh, projects that you would do at their university. So you should really talk about, like, here's a couple examples of projects where undergraduates could do this, that, and the other thing, because that shows how student-centered you are. Uh, do describe your plans for obtaining funding. So it's not that they don't want the grants, it's that that's not the main focus. So you should talk about how you're going to support your work. Um, so. With all of this, I have come up with a, many of you may have also thought of this idea before, but um, I think it's a kind of foolproof way to convince the people on the search committee that you are going to be perfect and ready for a job at a non-R1, and it's called the Tiered Research Funding Plan Approach. I should like name that officially or something because I'm so excited about this one. Everyone who does this at our university gets taken very seriously and looked at. This is something that is the biggest reason why people who um, people aren't considered is not doing something like this. Let me explain. So you're going to lay out tiered plans in your research statement and then again in your seminar for the following. You're going to start with research that you and your students could do right away with little to no funding. So for example, you have all these existing data sets that you're going to bring with you. You can get started right away without even worry without before your before the stuff you've ordered with your startup has come in, okay? So they can see that you're ready to go. The second one is that you're gonna have projects that you'll begin using your startup or maybe some small grants that are pretty, you know, you can expect that you may be uh, able to get. And then tell them about the projects that you'll begin if, if you do secure a large grant like NSF. This pleases everyone. No one can get mad about this. Everyone's excited to see that you're able to do it all. This pleases the people who are teaching oriented, who are suspicious of your R1 background and that are worried that you're gonna come in and wanna buy out all your time from teaching and just get big grants. Because if you talk about only number three, that won't please them. 
This also pleases the people who are more research focused, who are worried that you may not be able to be, you might be interested in applying for um, large funding. So by showing all three of these, you please everyone, and it really works every time. The diversity statement, I will say, is very similar at all universities. So I'm going to go through this really rapidly. I'm also not an expert on this because the diversity statements are newer, and this wasn't something that I did when I was a graduate student. So in general, I think that it's probably pretty similar from university to university. So you should discuss your own experiences with diversity and inclusion. Be specific about why this is important. So you want to talk about how it, why it's important to your own life and what you will bring to that university in terms of diversity and inclusion. Um, and then I think that one of the keys that I've seen um, that's important is to talk about ideas for improving these issues in both the classroom for teaching and in your own lab in research. This is a way where you really get to show that you've thought about these things and that it's important to you. And you're not just talking about in, in a lot of times people write a very abstract one and they don't talk about what they're going to do in the classroom and what they're going to do in their research lab. As usual, I'm talking for too long, so I'm kind of zooming now so we can get through the campus interview part. So uh, moving on. Um, recommendation letters. So obviously, this is going to, we're starting to get to the point where a lot of this is similar for all jobs. Ask people who know you best to write letters, including your PhD and postdoc advisors. Duh, everyone knows that. But this is one that we oftentimes don't get. Ask someone who has observed you teach to write you a letter. Uh, plan this out. Invite, uh, plan it out, do your best ever introductory lecture for lab of all time, ask your advisor to come watch you, and then tell them, tell them to include that in the letter. If you don't tell your advisor, they may not know that that's something they should include in the letter. You should ask them to touch on why you'd be great for that particular job, give them ideas like, oh, you know, I could do research on this in that area, and then ask them to focus on teaching and research, not just on research. Again, don't assume that, uh, they're going to appreciate this. Am I right, advisors? You love it when a student's like, can you touch on this, this, and this to help you write the letter? <laughs> it's great. I'm seeing some thumbs up around here. It's really helpful. OK. Interviews. You're going to get a phone interview, or now it's being replaced sometimes with a Zoom interview. Very controversial about whether or not they should be able to see you. That's an ongoing issue, OK? But you're going to be talking to them no matter, no matter what, whether it's a phone or face-to-face -face on a Zoom. So um, again, these apply to most jobs. Uh, ask who will be interviewing you ahead of time. Look them up online so that you know. There's the theme when we start to get into the interviews here is that everyone on that campus has a big ego. We're scientists. We want to know that people know who we are and have thought about us. It's true. Admit it. Practice answering typical questions. They're gonna, there's, there's questions you can just come up with that you know are going to get asked, right? You can also do Google searches for biology faculty job interviews. So why do you want this job? Which of our classes are you interested in teaching? Can you give us examples of student projects? Those are a few of the questions you're going to get asked at a non-R1 job. And then there could potentially be other ones in the future as well. When they ask you a question, answer the basics. Go about one minute, maybe, maybe two if it's a, if it, if it's a juicy one. Uh, and then ask if they would like more info before droning on. You don't want to be like talking forever. That's a big mistake most people make. And then um, being enthusiastic. So this was an advice that was given to me because I only had phone interviews. Or Zoom wasn't a thing. I don't think Skype was a thing back then. Um, if you smile, and I was sitting there like grinning manically into the wall, like if you smile, it does come through in your voice. And it makes a huge difference to the the cadence of your voice when you're smiling. Um, sell yourself. You, this is where you sell yourself. You need to tell them why they should hire you. So people who are um, you know, meek or don't want to brag, brag away. This is time. And remember that if you're worried about doing that, then you just voice everything in terms of the students. I'm really proud of my record of publishing with students instead of being like, I have got tons of publications. I'm proud of the opportunities I provided my students. You can change the language that way. Show that you're enthusiastic about teaching. Be prepared to tell them what you'd need to start your research. This is uncomfortable. They're going to ask you, so what would you need to start your research? And you're going to be like, oh my god, are you asking for a number? I don't know what your startup is. I don't know what to do. Just be vague. Say, well, you know, I mean, I, I, I would need this to get started, to some basic things. But if I had this, I could do much more. You know, Have a vague, have a vague idea. They're not going to ask for a startup list at that point. 
Um, and then you must have a good list of questions to ask them at the end. Believe it or not, um, sometimes search committee members can be so petty that if you say no on your uh, list of questions at the end, they won't like that and they'll be, they won't invite you. I know, people are shaking their heads. I'm telling you, it's crazy. They want to see that you like, want, you're dying of curiosity and interest because this is their, your top university that you applied to. So don't ask things that they could just find on a Google, that you could find in a Google search. Ask things about like where the students go to graduate school, where they get jobs, and so on. I have a big list of don't asks that are coming up. Don't ask about salary, startup, or teaching load. The number one question we get from people who end up being poorly suited is, so like, is the teaching load really high? Or like, so do faculty have any time to do research? And we're just like, you, you're, you're supposed to be liking teaching, right? And you might be worried about the teaching load. That's a legitimate worry. We're not trying to downplay that. The phone interview is not the time to ask it, okay? Not the time. You don't need to know that, do you? Because you're still gonna go on that, in, that on-campus interview if they invite you anyway, aren't you? So just wait. Wait to ask any of this stuff. No salary talk, no startup talk, no teaching load talk at all, period. Okay, woo, you got the campus interview. You are almost there. So I'm gonna be going quickly now so that we have plenty of time for questions. But I do have a few really important tips for you for the campus interview. And I think these go for every kind of job. Ahead of time, ask about seeing things and meeting people. Send a list of the stuff you wanna do on campus. Um, know the campus and faculty as best you can so that you can ask good questions. This is gonna lead into my pro tip that's coming up pretty soon. We recently had a person uh, apply for the job, got the job. And I remember afterwards, he left my office, and I'm like, what just happened? He knew my life story, he was so charming. I loved him, it was great. This is how people are, okay? They love to talk about themselves. Dress professionally, but not formally. You should do some research on what might be most appropriate for the university that you're applying to, because it varies from school to school. Oh, and big time, stay professional. You are always being interviewed, even at meals. Any of you who I'm meeting up with later, feel free to ask me to tell you horror stories of things that people have done in the evenings on these, on these interviews. They did not get the jobs. Okay, this is the big one, everyone. Don't talk about yourself the whole time. Contrary to what you think, oops, this is not actually about you. This is the weird thing. The campus interview is not about you. It's about your fit with the university. And the best candidates are ones who are asking questions, talking about collaborations, uh, going in and asking the students questions. Just recently we um, hired someone, and the grad students afterwards for some of the, one of the ones we didn't hire, they were like, they didn't have any questions for us at all. They just wanted to talk about themselves. Like, that's not a good look. They already know about you. You can answer their questions, but the more you ask, the better off you are. Um, so again, I'm not gonna really go through a lot of these. You all know how these work, really. Um, some of this information that I'm gonna zoom through now because I, once again, as usual, talk too much, is going to be in the email that I'll send you if you'd like the PDF of this. But uh, a couple highlights is um, make your presentation accessible to everyone from undergrads to faculty. So there's gonna be a lot of undergrads in your research seminar, and we care what they say. They all fill out forms and we care what they say and not our one. Maybe here they do too. Definitely describe what you've done in the past and what you, should, what you would do should you be hired at the university. So having specific, maybe 10 minutes at the end, projects to be done at that university. Be enthusiastic, again. Uh, okay, you're gonna do a mock lecture if you go apply to a non-R1. You're almost always gonna do a mock lecture. And you need to absolutely become an expert on that topic. You need to practice, you need to make sure it's, oh, here's a big mistake. Sometimes, and this is the most common thing, we'll say, advanced immunology class, you're gonna be doing you know, B cell recognition. And they'll teach it at like an intro bio level. So make sure that you do it at the correct level. And what you can do to figure out how to do that, because you feel like it, it's isolated, you don't know what just happened before in the class and what just happened after, is you can do this, um, this pro tip right here, which is providing a mock syllabus showing where the lecture would be in the context of the class. You can pass it out to people. You can project it. You can show them, oh, they will have just gotten T-cell receptor recognition beforehand, that kind of thing. But make sure you do it at the appropriate level. And you show that pedagogy. You sh I think in our recent search, 
Each candidate showed no fewer than two different pedagogical exercises in each 45 minute mock lecture. Show what you got. This is not about what you're teaching, it's about how you're teaching it. And you need to practice all those fun things. Um, this is all pretty you know, basic. This is the end, right? Send your thank you emails and you should keep a journal about what you think went well, what didn't. Talk to people about it and then you wait. And of course, um, Startup can usually be negotiated. I can talk about all these things later. These are more just general to general jobs. Um, but uh, I would say for everyone, consult with someone on the faculty about startup and equipment because you need that flow cytometer. You're not paying for it out of your startup uh, at a non R1. You're going to get them to buy it for you separately and then use your startup for supplies. That's a big difference, I think, than a lot of to R1. So sorry for rushing at the end, everyone, but I wanted to make sure I got through um, those, that important information, and I believe that that was it. Um, my, I didn't put, include my email address, but um, I'm sure that we can either provide that or it's just etaylor at calpoly.edu if you'd like me to send you a PDF of this. And I would love to take any questions now. All right. I have the question cube. That cube is cool. We need to have one of those in my school. Who had? I'll take it. Well, uh, you can hear me from here. I can hear well, you, I, but I can presume. Okay, I, I use this anyway. Uh, my question uh, is, is there a difference between uh, students at R1 and non-R1 in terms of uh, uh, what their uh, career plan, their need, their expectation from a course? Yeah, yeah, good question. So the question is, is there a difference in the students in terms of kind of everything, right? Their quality, their, what the expectations for a course. I would say that the variation is greater from university to university due to other factors than it is R1 to non-R1. So for example, within the California State University system and the UCs, we have huge variation where Cal Poly students are you know 4.0 GPA coming in, brilliant, wanting research experiences, very much more like a UC than they are like some of the other California State Universities, which are less selective. So I would say that there's a huge array from from school to school. So some uh, R ones are more selective for undergraduates than others. I can think of the two schools that I went to. UC Berkeley was an extremely selective R one university for undergrads, and Arizona State University which was very selective for PhD students, where I did my PhD, was not selective for um, undergraduates. So it's highly variable, I would say. Thank you. Yes. Mm. Oh, I can't see that far. <laughs> where am I going? While you're going over there, there's a Zoom question that I just I saw. You can keep going I, over there. Oh, On um, research-based versus teaching-based postdocs, I think is what it said. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I think that uh, I think that those are all great for at a non R1 uh, research postdoc, a teaching postdoc. However, you should try to continue doing both. So you should try to, if you're doing a full teaching postdoc, you should try to stay active in research as you go, um, keep working on your work. And then if you do a research postdoc, you should at least try to get guest lecturing experience and even possibly get a teacher of record experience on the side if it fits with you. So try to do both if you can to some degree or another but either one is a great option, um, yes. So, okay. So for the, the mock lecture, um, would you be doing a mock lecture on Yeah. Yeah, sorry I kind of, you know, had gotten to the point of the talk where I was rushing through that. So the mock lecture, it depends on the university. Some of them, so I went on three interviews um, before I got my job, and uh, they signed it for two of them and made me pick for one of them. And I'm honestly not sure which one was better, because when you pick, it's your area of specialty, and you may not be as, as able to explain things really well. Um, usually they're going to pick for you so that they can compare it among all of the applicants. And usually they're going to pick something that is key central component to the, one of the major courses they need to be taught. So they do want to see that you know what you're talking about. If you don't, you're in big trouble, but mostly they're looking at pedagogy and your potential to be a good teacher. We all know that, right? We all know that much of teaching is learning and experience, but there's also this kind of inherent gift people have, so they're looking for a combination of those two. Yeah. Thanks. If there's, and I don't know if there's more questions on there. I can't see them all. Yeah. 
I'll repeat it, so go ahead. It, it seems like the biggest challenge is actually making them on the short list. Yes. Um, if you're getting a thousand applications that are not on R1, surely they are not all already detailed. How are the first 70 in that scenario? Okay, great question. The question was, it seems like one of the hardest things is getting onto that short list for the short list either being the maybe list to begin with or, or the phone interview list, which is even shorter, yeah. Um, and so if you're doing lots of applications and if I'm reading lots of applications, what makes it stand out? And so this really goes back to what I was saying about personalizing your application, doing things that show that you have thought about Cal Poly, whatever school, and that you are suited for this job. So people show me I'm suited for this job because I have evidence um, in you know, mentoring students in research and I specifically uh, want to be in California because my study system right there on the bay would be excellent. And um, even saying I have family in the area is fine, as long as that's not your only reason. There's all, b tell them the truth, you know? Hey, I want to live in California. Hey, I wanna, that's great, as long as you also have other academic reasons. So the more personalized it is, and the more uh, in your teaching statement you show cool ideas and examples instead of the same essay on Bloom's Taxonomy that we all have read. Everyone's going to go back and get getting rid of Bloom's Taxonomy. No. Um, the more personalized it can get, and the more you're showing um, that you understand pedagogy and student-centered research, the more likely you are to make that shortlist. Now, you're gonna, some of you are going to write an amazing application, and you're not going to get on the shortlist, and you're going to go, what the heck? It was a perfect fit. Sometimes there's an unwritten fit thing in the job ad where they'll cast a wide net, but they really want a neuroscience, not just a physiologist. They, want, they say, I want a physiologist, but they want a neuroscience. So it's, it's a crapshoot at some point, but the more you personalize, the better chance you have. Three more on Zoom. Cool. Well, if you think of any questions, we are also doing um, a kind of community breakfast here tomorrow morning from 8.30 to 9.30 and 10.10 with donuts and coffee. So stop by and chat if you have any other things. Um, Dr. Taylor will be hanging out there. Otherwise, uh, let's give her another round of applause and thank you for coming. Thank you so much. I hope it helps. If any of you have a great job uh, job interview experience and you think I helped at all, send me an email. It would be so nice to hear. Thank you. <laughs>